Hello viewers and welcome back to another episode of The Model Guy. In this video we're going to be tackling Tamiya's Swordfish Mark II. A few weeks ago I held a vote on the channel to see what kits you would be interested in seeing built next. The Swordfish was the winner of that vote and this kit was sent all the way from Australia by fan of the channel Con George. So once again thank you Con for sending this kit. The Swordfish holds a special place for me because it was the first warbird I got to see fly in person. In 1994, a swordfish that had been recently restored after being found in Ontario in a farmer's field made its first and only flight at the Shearwater International Air Show. After that weekend, the swordfish was towed down the road and stored in the museum. The Shearwater Aviation Museum holds a special place for me as well because I spent a lot of time there as a young boy and even as a teenager while getting involved in the air cadet program. There was a gentleman there named Robert who was always building models for the museum, so that also ties into where I got my start. I would spend hours in his workshop watching him build kits. It's funny because that's now come full circle as I often have my friend's kids visit me while I'm downstairs in the workshop building my models. The Swordfish is definitely an aircraft that looked out of place in the Second World War, but it's one of the few aircraft that was in service before the war and continued for the entire duration. The Swordfish, also affectionately known as the String Bag, looked like an aircraft that would have belonged in World War I. While aircraft development worldwide was focusing on monoplane and all-mel construction, the Swordfish was canvas and a biplane. The irony is this is what made the Swordfish such an effective strike aircraft. With being a biplane, it was able to get off smaller ships and operate in extreme weather that would have other aircraft stuck on the deck. The only defense for the aircraft was a single Lewis machine gun in the back and its maneuverability. Surprisingly, it could outturn most naval fighters at the time. Two of the biggest naval successes for the British during World War II involved the Swordfish, one of them being the destruction of the Italian fleet, and the second, the sinking of the battleship Bismarck. In 1941, the Bismarck and her sister ship the Tirpitz were a serious threat to the British as they were the largest battleships ever built by Germany, and if they were able to get into the convoy lines that were keeping the British alive, they would do some serious damage and would be potentially unstoppable. On May 19th, the Bismarck and the Prince Eugen left their ports to head out towards the Atlantic supply lines. A Swedish reconnaissance flight spotted the Bismarck and her escorts and reported it to their headquarters, and the British attaché in Sweden transmitted the information to the Admiralty, and the chase was on. While the Bismarck was anchored in Norway, a Spitfire flying overhead managed to take a photo of the ship and her escorts to give a position for a bombing raid, but unfortunately the weather was too severe for the strike force to find the ship. The British fleet went on high alert, and the HMS Hood, along with the newly commissioned battleship, the Prince of Wales, were set out towards Denmark to find the Bismarck. Just before 6 in the morning on May 24th, German lookouts had spotted the Prince of Wales, and the fight was on. An early mistake in the battle, though, by the British cost them dearly, as the Hood engaged the smaller Prince Eugen, mistaking it for the Bismarck. After firing only three salvos, the Bismarck had the range down to the Hood and its fifth salvo was the one that destroyed it. One of the rounds from the Bismarck had struck the Hood's ammunition compartment and destroyed the ship, killing 1,400 men and leaving only three survivors. It was now a two-verse-one fight, with the one British ship trying to hold its ground as it suffered strikes from both German ships. The first rounds from the Bismarck against the whales struck the bridge, killing everyone in there except for the captain and one other seaman. Even with half of her guns out of action, the Prince of Wales continued to fight back against the Bismarck and landed three hits doing damage to the German ship. After only 18 minutes of fighting, the Prince of Wales retreated under a smokescreen and the two forces sailed their separate ways. The Bismarck wasn't completely unscathed though as it was leaving a trail of oil behind it like a breadcrumb trail. The Prince of Wales has now joined forces with the Suffolk and Norfolk that were trailing the Bismarck. After the loss of the Hood, Prime Minister Winston Churchill now ordered all warships in the area to join the pursuit of the Bismarck, and ships that were escorting convoys and even as far away as Halifax joined in the search. With the Bismarck outpacing the British ships trailing it, the home fleet coming from another direction made the choice to launch swordfish torpedo bombers from the HMS Victorious. The fog of war led to confusion as the inexperienced aviators flying the swordfish nearly attacked the Norfolk and a U.S. Coast Guard cutter that were shadowing the Bismarck and the Bismarck's anti-aircraft gunners were alerted by the commotion. After quickly realizing their error, the swordfish pressed on to attack the Bismarck. Because of how low the ferry swordfish torpedo bombers were able to fly to the water, the Bismarck's anti-aircraft guns couldn't depress low enough to hit them, and the only thing the Bismarck could do in defense was use its main guns to hit the water in front of the swordfish to try to create splashes to stop them. None of the attacking swordfish bombers were shot down, and eight of the nine torpedoes launched against the Bismarck missed, but one was able to strike the ship and slow it down. 
The Bismarck's damage control teams were quickly able to repair the damage to bring the ship back up to its full speed, and now the fight was entering open water and the U-boats were able to come to the aid of the Bismarck, forcing the British fleet to start to zigzag. With the British ships change in direction every 10 minutes, there was always a time for a few moments where the Bismarck was out of radar contact, and then it was able to finally break contact and disappear again. Several reports from the French resistance had reported that the Luftwaffe was moving fighter units to the French coast, and the British suddenly realized they may have made a mistake, and the Bismarck was returning to its own air cover. They now realized they had been sailing seven hours in the wrong direction and had less than a day to get the Bismarck. With the British covering suspected ports that the Bismarck would try to return to, luck was on their side again as a Catalina flying boat once again spotted the Bismarck. With many of the larger British ships having to break contact due to a lack of fuel, it was now up to the swordfish to stop the Bismarck. The first strike launched from the Ark Royal almost ended in a disaster as the swordfish attacked their own ship, the HMS Sheffield, using torpedoes with new magnetic detonators. Luckily for the Sheffield, the new detonators did not work and the ship didn't sustain any damage. The swordfish returned to the Ark Royal and rearmed with contact detonated torpedoes and went out once again to strike the Bismarck. As the HMS Sheffield closed the distance with the Bismarck to begin firing, 15 swordfish descended from the clouds and began their attack on the Bismarck. Two torpedoes launched struck the Bismarck. With the torpedoes jamming the rudder of the Bismarck and causing major flooding, the Bismarck could do nothing but helplessly circle as the British home fleet closed in for the kill. The most technologically advanced battleship in the world had been stopped by an aircraft using technology left over from the First World War. Now let's talk about painting this kit. I started off using AK's real color pack for the fleet air arm. However, I found that the slate gray didn't really have a strong green tint to it. So I chose to come back in with the Vallejo slate gray just to kind of bring some more depth to that paint. That may just be a mistake on my part because I know when the Americans were making aircraft for the British, such as the Hellcat, they were using olive drab for the greens instead of the slate gray. So maybe that's just something that's been mixed up with recolorations or my own interpretation of the color. As usual, I've changed the tones of the paint a little bit by doing some marbling with a brighter and lighter color just to make that paint almost dance a little bit. And I found that the PRU blue was perfect for that gray. It just gives it that slight bluish hue as well. To get that nice, accurate feathered edge, I just took a one-to-one -one scale blueprint from the Tamiya instructions and just put a piece of two-sided tape underneath just to give it that nice space to give the feathered look. And to avoid these thicker than usual Tamiya decals, I just simply painted on the roundels and markings using the silhouette machine to cut them. Doing the roundels on the side of the swordfish were a little more than usual with the silhouette machine. So all I did was create some concentric circles to build up the different parts of the mask I would need. And then I just built the colors up starting with the lightest to darkest. Next time I do this, I think I'll start with the roundels first before painting the camouflage. That way it avoids any of that white creep you get underneath the roundels. My understanding is as well, if you paint the roundels and that stuff first, it'll actually avoid any little steps you get in the paint as well. I didn't go full out with the weathering on this aircraft just because I was already gonna be getting into the rigging and I didn't know how that was gonna turn out. So I didn't wanna to put too much effort in before I knew what the payout was gonna be. And with gluing the upper wings on and not following instructions, I kind of shot myself in the foot and we'll get into that here in a moment. But as for weathering, I kept it dialed back and when we had the setback with the wing happen, it kind of killed my mojo for this build quite a bit. With this being a biplane, it's hard to paint the underside of those upper wings if they're attached to the airframe. So I kept everything apart for painting and then followed the instructions for how Tamiya has you build the wings as a sub-assembly before attach them either in the extended or stowed position. And even though all the test fitting had shown that with the wings assembled, they would fit snugly to the aircraft, I ran into a huge issue where a step prevented that. Here's one of the reference photos I used for the rigging, and you can see it's not the same style turnbuckles you see other modelers use. Instead, there's like a T fitting at the bottom where the spar goes into the wing. So to recreate that, I simply used some 0.5 millimeter ID brass tubing. And from what's happened with this top wing, we'll get, I'll show you here in a second. I believe that the rigging may have been causing some, I don't know, may have been distorting the way the wings are supposed to sit square or pulling them down a little bit because what happens is the inner part of the wing is too far apart to match up with the fuselage. 
I would have thought that this inner brace would prevent that and kind of keep it idiot proofed, but we're always designing a better idiot, so sorry Tamiya, that's probably my fault. Just a little more footage here showing the rigging as this is the first biplane I've ever done, so this was a definite challenge and I enjoyed it and I think next time um, for a World War One plane I'll probably use the Yushi fine rigging thread just because it's a little bit smaller than this and I'd be able to run it through turnbuckles and have the wire come back but the swordfish actually uses steel uh, spars almost so I decided to go with the thicker easy line just to match that a little closer. The nice thing about the easy line is it kind of snaps to where you put the super glue so it's easy to work with you just can't stretch it too much. And now here comes the mojo killing part of the build after all this rigging excited how it's looking this wing doesn't want to line up it's either the top wing or the lower wing that lines up. I couldn't get them both to seat properly at the same time. I didn't want to force it too much because it would end up splitting the upper part of the wing there over the fuselage, but just trying to give it a little bit of shove, it did not want to go in. I find one of the best things to do in this situation when things are not going well is to step away from it and move on to something else, either another model kit or another section of the build. I usually only build one model at a time, so I'll usually find another sub-assembly I can build. Since the bottom part of the wing was sitting well, I decided just to kind of tack that in place just so I'd have something square to work from while trying to repair the top wing. One of the harder things to capture on the swordfish is the cowling color. Some of them are polished aluminum, some are just aluminum, and the one in the Aviation Museum in Shearwater is a copper one. So I went with the other swordfishes I could find pictures of that are restored and just try to get that color change that happens with the light. Like it'll look silver or bronze depending on the angle it's at. Tamiya's done a really good job showing the detail in this Pegasus engine and a lot of it is visible even after you have the cowling on. So I made sure to hit it with at least a wash and to paint those push tubes, just have a little bit of interest there. While the last bit of the engine is coming together and paint, why don't you write in the comment section below what is something that's happened to you with a model kit that's made you pretty much give up or put it on the side of a shelf for a couple months? Let me know below. And also don't forget to, as always, click subscribe, like if you haven't, and also make sure you set that bell to let you know when new videos are posted. Now, finally, for the correction for this wing, I found that the best option I had was to cut out that step inside because that's what seemed to be forcing that upper wing half apart on the above the fuselage. So by taking a razor saw and making that square, I would basically have a butt joint. There would be nothing to line it up, but that would give me the option to push that wing down or up a little bit just to have the best alignment I could get. And once I was happy with the alignment, I put a little bit of glue in to hold it in place and then afterwards filled the seam with super glue and rescribed the line. It's kind of a hackish type fix. But in the end, it was the fastest and it made it look decent and I figured that was the best way to fix it. That's gonna bring this build to a close. This kit's not gonna win any awards, but it's a good stepping stone for me because having this sent from Australia by Con George, it forced me to approach some things I normally haven't done with a model yet. I haven't done rigging, I haven't done a biplane, so it's kind of forced me to consider how I'd approach this and to think out the build a lot more before actually starting it. So I'm happy to have those skills in the toolbox to move forward with. And I hope that's a lesson for everybody here. Like when you make mistakes on a model, it's an opportunity to learn and really get better at it. I hope you've enjoyed this build video and as always stay healthy out there, enjoy building models and enjoy sniffing glue. I am the model guy and see you next time.